Omagyan, Timidandasya, Gyanajana Salakaya, Chaksun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Guruvena Maha, Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prastaya Bhutale, Shri Bhakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamini Namaste Saraswati Deva Gaur Vani Pacharine Nirvasesa, Sunyavari Pastyat Yade Satarine, Panchakopa Tarubhishya Kripa Sindhu Vaibhya Patitanam Bhavane Bhyo Vaishnava Bhyo Namaho Namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadar Sri Vasari Gaur Bhakta Vrindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya hmm. Reading from Canto Eight, chapter 12, verse 32. Tasya nudva moga reta saha. Susmino yuta pasyeva Vasitam manudvavataha Tasya nudvavato retas Chaksanda moga retasaha Susmino yata pasyeva Vasitam manudvavataha Tasya no dvavato retas Chaskanda moga retasaha Susmino yuta pasyeva Vasitam manudvavataha Anyone else? Mm -hmm. Tasya of him, Lord Shiva, Anudvavataha, one who wa who was following Rita, the semen, Kas Kas Chaskanda, discharged. 
Amogareta Saha, of that person whose discharge of semen never goes in vain. Shushmina, mad. Yukta Pasya, of a mad elephant, of a male elephant, yeah. Eva, just like Vasitam, to a female elephant, able to conceive pregnancy. Anu Dvavataha, following translation. Just as a maddened bull elephant follows a female elephant who is able to conceive pregnancy, Lord Shiva followed the beautiful woman and discharged semen, even though his discharge of semen never goes in vain. Hmm. Verse number 33. Hmm. Yata yata patam mayam retas tayas mahatmanaha tani rupasya hem nascham shatra asam mahipate. O king, whatsoever on the surface of the globe, I'm sorry, we'll, we'll do that again. O king, wheresoever on the surface of the globe fell the semen of the great personality, Lord Shiva, mines of gold and silver later, later appeared. Hmm. Purport. Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, that those who seek gold and silver can worship Lord Shiva from material opulences. Lord Shiva lives under a bail tree and does not even construct a house in which to dwell. But though he is apparently poverty stricken, stricken, his devotees are sometimes opulently endowed with large quantities of silver and gold. Parikshan Maharaj later asks about this, and Sukadev Goswami replies, hmm, Om Gyan. Namah Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pastai Bhutale Shimakti Bhakti Vananda Swami Ti Namani Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Pajari Ne Nirvasi Sasunyavari Pasyatya De Satari There's one particular pastime that Prabhupada would tell um, wherein Parvati and Lord Shiva are together and Parvati says to Lord Shiva, you know, Lord Shiva, you're worshipped by so many great personalities and you're honored everywhere. And all great personalities who are honored, they have some place to live. But we don't have any place to live. It says, he lives under a bale tree, doesn't even have a house. That's Lord Shiva. So, Shiva thought, all right, maybe my wife has some good suggestion. So they had a house built. Lord Shiva had a house built. And so now he had a house and his wife was happy, Parvati. But when you have a house, you have to have what is called a welcoming ceremony, where you welcome all the great sages, saints, and others to bless the house to make sure that it becomes auspicious. So, Lord Shiva, following the proper etiquette, invited all these personalities to come. And they came, there was a nice celebration, and they uh, blessed the house. <laughs> then, of course, there is another part to the ceremony wherein you have to give some dakshin to the great sages. So when Lord Shiva was trying to see what he could give, he doesn't have anything. But then he remembered, oh, I have a house. <laughs> so he gave the house for doxing, and he was back underneath the bale tree. <laughs> Baba tells that story. <laughs> it's Lord Shiva. He doesn't care about anything material. <laughs> Even a house, he's not interested. So it says here in the previous verse, one whose semen 
never fall, never goes in vain. It's mentioned that one of the births of Lord Hanuman was part of this particular pastime where the seminum of Lord Shiva was taken and later given to Anjani, Anjana. Because uh, Hanuman is known as Anjana Putra. He's the son of Anjana. She was a fallen demigoddess. She had committed an offense and had was forced to leave the higher realms and come to the, this level. But still, she got the blessing of having, and that's a long story, she got the blessings of having uh, um, the son like Hanuman. Hanuman takes different births in different times and through different situations. He's also known as Keshari Putra. His father was a prince named Keshari. But he's also known as the son of Shiva too. If you go into certain places in India, you see Panchamukha Hanuman. Hanuman with five heads. <laughs> There's one such place in, I believe, in Kurukshetra. There's a beautiful, there's a big 35, well, talk about meters, it's about a 10 meter high statue of Lord Hanuman in, in uh, Kurukshetra. So Hanuman is, uh, he's also known as the son of Lord Shiva in one of the incarnations. He comes at different times. But he's also a Chiranjivan. That means he is eternally existing somewhere. He doesn't, he never dies, Hanuman. Although he appears in different ways at different times. So one time it's from the semen of, uh, from this particular pastime that was captured. And then... Uh, given to Anjani, and that's a, a particular bird actually transformed it, trans, not transformed it, but trans, what's the word, transported it, that's it, transported it. So Shiva is very powerful, and uh, he's known as Asutos. He's easily pleased, easily angered. He has many names, Mahadev. Prabhupada will always like to refer to him as Mahadev, the best of all the demigods. And here you see how he's simply acting apparently like an ordinary person being bewildered by a beautiful woman. But the beautiful woman is not just an ordinary beautiful woman, it is Krishna. <laughs> so Krishna has, he has his Maya Shakti, which is so powerful that he can bewilder anyone. <laughs> so, even Lord Shiva, who was thinking, I'm beyond bewilderment, but we see. And here it says that, just like there's a nice example, when a female elephant becomes, she goes in heat and she wants some relationship with the male elephant. When the male elephant sees that, he be he goes into what is called musk, and he becomes mad. <laughs> and when he goes mad, sometimes he goes running, and he stampedes villages, and he destroys everything. Elephant in heat, a male elephant is just dangerous. Sometimes they evacuate the whole build, the village when they see the elephant is coming in this direction. Yeah. There's one story where one, there was one mad, mad elephant. He was just terrorizing everyone. He was mad all the time. <laughs> and there was one great personality living at the time. He was named was, uh, what's his name? Oh, God. <sighs> I'm bad with names. He was the disciple of Shamananda Pandit. His name was, can't think of his name, very powerful preacher. In fact, he made the whole providence of Utkala, which is now known as Jagannath Puri area. Uh, what's his name? Can't think, it's falling, kind of coming close. And uh, he was so powerful that 
when the elephant was coming, he decided to confront the elephant. So the elephant was running madly through villages. And so he stood in one place, and the elephant was coming, charging at him with full force. And he was just standing there. And then when the elephant came, he just raised his hand. The elephant stopped. And then he went like this, and the elephant paid his obeisances. And the elephant became calm and peaceful in his association. And then he instructed the elephant, why are you causing harm and so much destruction? You know, you should give up this activity and become a nice devotee. And so the elephant did, and he gave him the name uh, Rasikananda, as that's what his name was, Rasikananda. And then he gave him the name Gopal, gave him the name Elephant and Gopal. <laughs> so the elephant became a devotee. There's a cold breeze coming in from somewhere here. Oh, this thing is on again here. You can shut it off. Yeah. Oh, you can. Yeah. On. You don't know how to shut it off. Huh? All right. Okay. This is called shutting it off without shutting it off. Yeah, I guess this is Slovenia. Everyone likes the cold here. In summertime, nobody's around. Yeah, in wintertime, it's crowded. <laughs> so, me and some of Dutch, we have a little rasa going about cold weather. <laughs> she loves cold weather, and I... I'm like this, you know. <laughs> so. Yes, so even this garland is too cold. <laughs> she puts this garland on, it'll probably just turn into fire or something. <laughs> okay. What are you going to do with that? Oh, on that side. Okay. Yeah. Keep building it. Maybe we can just recon we can direct the whole temple here. Okay. Still cold, but anyway. The only one that knows how to do it is Sananta, and he doesn't tell anybody <laughs> how to shut it off. <laughs> you hear that, Ananta? Okay. <laughs> Okay, Lord Shiva. Um, we Vaishnava Nam Yita Shambhu. He's the greatest of all Vaishnavas because he undergoes such austerity in order to preach Krishna consciousness that he'll go to any situation to save the conditioned souls. He's so kind to, to the conditioned souls that he, it doesn't matter who they are, he'll give them shelter, even the lowest of the lowest, ghosts, hobgoblins, jinns, and various types of demoniac persons. Approach Lord Shiva. Okay, we're getting better here. Okay. Okay. Doesn't work, does it? Okay. So when we speak about Lord Shiva, he is so merciful and so kind. But here we see him in a different situation. Thank you. I have to go shopping. I'll be right back. <laughs> I need some more clothes here. No, there's nothing in there. Okay. 
Okay, thank you, Mother Sri Devi. I have so many mothers. It's nice. Okay. Hare Krishna. So here, and then we go in this particular verse with the purport here, it's, he's so renounced, Lord Shiva. Um, those who are, in, there's a nice section in the end of the 10th canto where it explains that the devotees of Lord Krishna, they have nothing, but Krishna has everything. Krishna's Dwarka dish, he has opulences and power palaces and so many queens and Krishna is like he's a, he's a prince, he's a king when he's in Dwarka and but his devotees they're considered to be poverty stricken but Lord Shiva he's poverty stricken but all his followers are wealthy <laughs> people worship Lord Shiva for for, for wealth I've met many Shiva Bhaktas, and many of them are well-to-do. <laughs> they uh, they worship Lord Shiva, and he gives them, or he arranges for them to get a great amount of wealth. He even says here, that here it says, those who, those who seek gold and silver can worship Lord Shiva for material opulences. Wow. So he provides even the most precious of all metals, gold, silver, other things like lapis lazuli and rubies, sapphires, sapphires, so many. So that's Lord Shiva. But he is very renounced. But he's, very, he's always preaching to the conditioned souls and giving them a chance to come to Krishna consciousness. And there's a whole series of verses in the uh, Srimad Bhagavatam in the uh, uh, fourth canto where Lord Shiva is just constantly glorifying Lord Vishnu. And Shiva is so great, sometimes he is seen as the Supreme Lord himself. There are many Puranas, especially the Shiva Purana, the Linga Purana, or the Bhavishya, or maybe even Bhavishya Purana, which actually give statements that one should worship Shiva as the Supreme Lord. Sometimes devotees come in contact with Shiva Bhaktas and they try to instruct them. Uh, Shiva plays three roles. He is the best of all devotees. He's a demigod. And he is also worshipped as the Supreme Personality of Godhead by a large amount of his followers. <laughs> so he's in three different positions. That's why to understand Lord Shiva is very difficult. In fact, Shiva, Shiva Tattva is very, very difficult to sort out. Because in one role, he's the best of all bhaktas. In another, he's a powerful deva who's controlling the mode of ignorance. And in another role, he's actually accepting worship as the Supreme Lord. Hmm. Why does he accept worship as the Supreme Lord? Because just to get those followers that don't worship Krishna, or can't worship Krishna, or do, do not want to worship Krishna, he takes them and allows them to worship him. And then what happens... Once they worship him, because he is the greatest of all devotees and demigods, they make advancement, and that prepares them, or gives them certain qualities where they can start to worship Lord Krishna. Hmm. I have met many Shiva Bhaktas who later became Krishna Bhaktas. <laughs> One of them is now known as Chandramali Swami. <laughs> huh? You also Shiva Bhakti. Any other Shiva Bhaktas here? I mean, you go through it, you'll find it. Yeah. So uh, I used to carry. I even when I joined the Hare Krishna movement, I had a 
one of these buttons you pin on, and it was a button of Lord Shiva. I would keep it on my bee bag for the first five years I was a devotee. <laughs> Prabhupada gave me the name Lord, of Lord Shiva because Chandramali actually means Lord Shiva. <laughs> so I got lucky. <laughs> So, yeah, Lord Shiva is really, and he's very, he's super Muslim and very, very powerful, too. Extremely powerful. But devotees pray to Shiva, or we don't worship Shiva as the Supreme, but we can pray to Shiva for his mercy, so he can give us Krishna Bhakti. And that's the whole thing. Uh, and this is also true for other great souls, that we approach other great souls. Because in order to approach Krishna, it's quite difficult. In fact, it's practically impossible. You have to be very pure. But if you get some recognition by other great souls who are fixed in Krishna worship, then that, that mercy can bring you closer to Krishna. So we want that. We uh, devotees are always seeking the blessings and mercy of great souls in order to uh, progress on the path of devotional service. That is our success in Krishna consciousness here. And Lord Shiva is one such personality. And he, uh, he has so many amazing, amazing pastimes. Most of the times he's giving out benedictions. Sometimes he gives out benedictions to devotees. But many times he gives out benedictions to demons. Because uh, even demons, we see even, even Harani Kashipu worship Lord Brahma. And Shiva and Ravana worship Lord Shiva. And Bikrasura worship Lord Shiva. And there are so many personalities that worship Lord Shiva. And um, if you go, now Shiva is only worshipped in his form as Shiva, I think in only one or two places in all of India that I know of. He's worshipped in his linga form. There's, he was cursed not to be worshipped in his personal form. Do you know that story? How he got cursed. Brahma got cursed at the same time. It's a uh, pastime where Lord Brahma was performing a yagya at a place called Pushkar in India. Pushkar is a very interesting place. And Brahma was performing a yagya. And uh, he was waiting for his consort Saraswati to come because he needed his consort in order to uh, in order to uh, complete the yagya and she wasn't coming she just wasn't coming I guess she was getting decorated up you know how ladies when they get decorated up it takes forever <laughs> Sometimes it does. So she was taking, getting decorated up to come to the yagya, but it was taking too long. So uh, the priests who were doing the yagya, they said, Lord Brahma, the yagya will not be successful if it's not begun according to the titi or the time. So you must begin now. Otherwise, it will be unsuccessful. So, what to do? He had to have a consort. So there was one lady there. Her name was Gayatri. She was goddess Gayatri. So Gayatri was there. So he took her as his substitute consort for the yagya, just for the yagya. And the yagya began. And then after about partway through the yagya, Saraswati comes, and she is not happy. She's like fire. 
and she starts cursing everybody. Brahma. She, I don't know what she called him, but she called him some other names too. <laughs> she said, Brahma, I curse you that you will only be worshipped in this place and nowhere else. So if you go to India, you see that Lord Brahma is only worshipped in Pushkar. There's a temple there, Brahma. Nowhere else. <laughs> Lord Shiva, you were here. And you, you, you didn't do anything to stop it. So you should be cursed also. So I curse you that you will be only worshipped in your linga form. So that's what happened to Shiva. And Vishnu, he was also there. She said, Vishnu, you will not be seen publicly. You'll only be found in the hearts of the, de of the devotees. <laughs> and then she cursed Gayatri too. Yeah. And this is a very important thing because we know that Gayatri mantra, you can't speak it out loud. You have to chant it softly. No, not even softly. You have to chant it silently. Gayatri is always chanted silently. So she said to Mother Gayatri, your glories will never be sung loudly. So since then we chant Gayatri. What we say uh, inaudibly like that. So, so that's how Shiva got cursed. Mm -hmm. Saraswati is powerful, goddess of learning. And she's also an expansion of the Mahalakshmi, who is the goddess of fortune. <laughs> so, yeah, so this is Lord Shiva's situation. And it says here, of course, he, he doesn't even want to live in a very nice, opulent place. He's not interested in living. He lives in the jungle under a bale tree. He has a place... Just between the material and spiritual worlds, there's three realms of existence. There's one, one is called Devidam, the other one is called Maheshtam, and the other one's called Haridam. Haridam is the spiritual world, Maheshtam is the abode of Shiva, and Devidam is this material realm. So three Dams. So between the spiritual and material world, there is the boat of Lord Shiva. Now, if you travel outside of the, the universes, because the universes are covered with each of the layer of the material elements, and as you go to the highest point and you come to the material elements, earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, and false ego, each one of these elements is ten times thicker than the previous one. So what covers this material energy is these eight elements, strong coverings you can't get out. Even if you try, you have to get through these eight elements. And there are, each one is ten times thicker than the previous one. But if one who goes beyond that, where do they come? They come into this realm of darkness, complete darkness. And you travel in there for billions and billions of miles in this realm of darkness until finally you come to this area of light. And in that area of light there is uh, Mahakailash, the planet of Lord Shiva. So he lives on that planet with uh, Parvati, his consort. And if that area of light is getting light from the Brahma Jyoti, which is coming from the spiritual world, down into that realm, which is Kailash. So that's the light is coming from the spiritual world, like that. So that is the abode of Lord Shiva. And then that's that light, if you go into that light, and then you finally come to the Vaikuntha realms, and then going through the Vaikuntha realms, you come to the topmost planet in the Vaikuntha realm is Ayodhya Dham, the abode of Lord Ramchandra. And then if you go beyond that, you come into the area of Goku, uh, Goloka Dham, into the area of Krishna's abode in the spiritual world. Now, this is a very, it's interesting. 
and very helpful to know how the everything is structured. It's a beautiful, beautiful structure of how everything is laid out so nicely. But here we are, and then, of course, there's seven planetary systems, and uh, the Earth is the, is the lowest of the seven. We are called Bur Loka, Om, Bur, Bhuva. There's Bur and Bhuva. Bur Loka is the planet of the ghostly spirits. That's a little bit higher than the Earth. So around the Earth, there are planets of ghostly spirits. That's why you see so many ghosts come to this planet sometimes. Some of them are benevolent, and some of them are malevolent. <laughs> so benevolent and malevolent ghosts circle around the earth, and there's planets there, and there's planets of the Rakshasas, and below the earth there are lower planets and then higher planets. Then if you go way below the earth, then you start going into the, the whole planetary systems of the lower and then you meet various types of beings that are of the are of ghostly nature, demon, demons and others like that. But they have great opulences on these planets. Mm -hmm. So Krishna's creation is so great, so complex, and so impossible to understand. It's just so... And even the material world, nobody can understand it, how it's structured, how... There's thousands and thousands and millions of universes. Koti. Koti. Koti means millions. Millions of universes. And this universe that we live in, the one we live in here, is the smallest of all the universes. This is a small universe. and considered to be the smallest. That's why Brahma only has four heads. <laughs> has only four heads. But if you go to other universes, Brahma has more and more heads. And then there's, there's one particular story where the four-headed Brahman wanted to come to see Krishna in Dwarka. So Krishna was there in his palace in Dwarka, and Brahma came, and he came to the door. And then um, the doorkeeper, maintaining Krishna's palace in Dwarka, came to the door and saw the four-headed Brahman. And Brahma said, I would like to meet Lord Krishna. I have some business. So the doorkeeper went back, told Lord Krishna that this four-headed Brahman, uh, the, no, he said, uh, Brahma is here. And then Krishna said, which Brahma? Which Brahma? And so the uh, doorkeeper came back and said, Lord Krishna wants to know which Brahma are you? Because there's many Brahmas. And Brahma was shocked. He was thinking, which Brahma? I'm Brahma. <laughs> and then he was thinking, why is Krishna asking which Brahma? And then uh, all of a sudden, he saw, which appeared everywhere, Krishna arranged it, that uh, all of the Brahmanas from all of the different universes who have like 10 heads, 20 heads, 50 heads, 1,000 heads, millions of heads, they all appeared. According to the size of the universe, Brahma has a particular amount of heads because he's got to watch everything. <laughs> And he's a, he's a jiva. So when he's Lord Brahma, the forehead of Brahma, saw all these other brahmanas, and they all came with their helmets on, and they all simultaneously offered their obeisances to Lord Krishna. The, noise, the, the sound of them all making their obeisances with their helmets touching the ground was so tumultuous that it shook the whole uh, universe. And then Brahma got the understanding. I'm just an insignificant Brahma. Because <laughs> he was thinking, well, I'm Lord Brahma, you know. <laughs> but compared to the other Brahmas, he was really small. 
Now this is an example, even Brahma is considered to be insignificant, what to speak of us. It's like in the material world, a conditioned soul will think, I'm so great, I've got money, I got position, I got opulences, and he thinks, I'm, go I'm, I'm great. Prabhupada tells one story. There was one devotee. Mm, he was living in the temple in Los Angeles, California. And uh, so Prabhupada could understand he was feeling. So Prabhupada started to tell a little story. Prabhupada said, This material world is only one quarter of the entire existence. Three quarters make up the spiritual world. So one, this is one quarter, three quarters in size is the spiritual world. And in this one quarter, of which is the material realm, there are so many universes. And in each universe there's so many living entities. And in each of the universes there are so many planets. And so therefore there are so many living entities on all, so many planets in these universes. And then, this particular universe that we live in is the smallest of all universes, and there, there are millions and uncountable living entities. And then Prabhupada goes on to say, and on this one, uni uh, one universe, there's one planet, it's called Earth. And there's so many planets in this, un in this universe, and Earth is one of the planets, and there's so many living entities on the Earth. And then Prabhupada went on to say, and on this earth there are so many countries. In each one of the countries, there are so many living entities. And now we are here in one of the countries called the United States of America, and there are so many living entities. And in the United States of America, there is one city uh, called uh, Los Angeles, Although in the United States of America there are so many cities, and each of the cities has so many living entities. And out of all of those cities, there's one city called Los Angeles, California. And in the Los Angeles, California, there's so many living entities living there. And in Los Angeles, California, there are so many streets. And here we are in one of the streets called Watsika Boulevard. And there's so many people living in the street of Watsika Boulevard. And there are so many houses in the street of Watsika Boulevard where so many living entities are living. And there's one house on Watsika Boulevard known as the Hare Krishna Temple. <laughs> and there are so many living entities in the Hare Krishna Temple. And then there is one living entity in the Hare Krishna Temple who thinks he's great. <laughs> So Prabhupada did that to this one devotee. I, I won't mention his name. <laughs> you probably know who I'm talking about. Uh, just to give him a little indication, you're not so great. <laughs> there are unlimited, uncountable living entities. So that's the false ego of the living entity. He thinks, I'm great. <laughs> but... Chivir Surupai Krishna and Dichidas. The living entities are just, we're called jiva. Jiva means tiny. Tiny means very small. So, what is, what is the size of the living entity? You can't even see it. You can see your body and you can measure it. But what, can you measure the soul? The soul is one ten thousand, the tip of a hair. So if you take a hair and you cut the, the top into a hundred pieces and you take one of those hundred pieces and you cut that into a hundred pieces, that's the size of the soul. <laughs> that's how big you are. <laughs> We're really small. <laughs> In fact, you're so small they can't even see you. <laughs> well, in other words, you can't see the soul because it's so small. Yeah. It's not possible to even be seen. So, uh, yeah. So this is a little bit of the indication of the greatness of Krishna's. So, therefore, the, the most important quality 
that makes the devotee successful in Krishna consciousness is humility, realizing how small I am. I am nothing. And Krishna is everything, and everybody else is greater than me. <laughs> if one thinks like that, then one can chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> if one thinks he's very advanced, or thinks he's better than others, thinks she's better than others, and it becomes difficult to chant. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Okay, any questions or comments? Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you for the lecture. I'm interested about these courses. Um, I didn't catch it. Who was that person who cursed Brahma, Shiva, yeah, it was, Gayatri? It was Brahma's wife, Saraswati. Saraswati, okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, if Shiva is so powerful, why did he accept or and yeah. all of them? They, he could have overturned the curse because of his power, but he didn't. He respected the curse. <laughs> okay, he respected. It's, that's that's true. Also, a lot of times, a person gets cursed and they respect the curse. Where's there's an example in the shastras? I'm trying to think where what the example that, huh? Pariksit Maharaj, exactly. Pariksit Maharaj. He could have overturned the curse of that Brahmin boy who cursed him to, to die in seven days, but he didn't. He accepted it. And therefore, he took the opportunity to, you know, go back home, back to Godhead. Mm -hmm. So that was his choice, actually. Yeah. Okay. Prabhupada says that. He, he you know, he, he, he was very powerful, and he could have just you know, nullified the curse, but he didn't. <laughs> a lot of times you see that um, a curse is given just to respect the curse or to give credence to the person who gives the curse. A curse is accepted like that. That happens. There's another example of that too, I think. Yeah. Sometimes devotees get cursed too. <laughs> that happens. Huh? Narada Muni, he got cursed by Daksha. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And he accepted the curse. He was cursed that he couldn't stay in one place more than three days. And he kept traveling, so that's what he does now, just keeps traveling. Prabhupada said, I've been cursed by the, by the uh, disciple, by the, by the parents of my disciples. And therefore, I want to stay in one place and, uh, and uh, do Srimad Bhagavatam and finish it. But I can't because I've been cursed by the the uh, parents of my disciples. So I'm asking my sannyas uh, students to take up the curse and let them travel for me so I can stay in one place. <laughs> Prabhupada said that about us. <laughs> yeah. And so the devotees wanted to please Prabhupada, so the sannyasis accepted that. <laughs> So curses, you know, curses are very interesting. Sometimes you can modify them. Sometimes you can nullify them, which is really hard to nullify them, depending on who they come from. But sometimes they they're accepted because someone sees that there's some benefit in the curse, 
A lot of times when you when a person gets cursed, they get benefited. Usually curses are meant to benefit the person and not simply um, a way to try to punish them. It, look, it may look like a punishment, but usually per persons who are who have that power do it in order to bring that person to a higher stage of life, Krishna consciousness. So Shiva is worshipped in his linga form everywhere. I guess, because I don't think Shiva's going to counteract the curse at this point. <laughs> but he has the power to do it if he wants to. But there is a place, I've been there, there's a place in, there's a few places actually, there's a place in Maharashtra. Maharashtra is the biggest province in India. So Astra means... Uh, place and Maha means Maharashtra means the biggest providence and there's a place called Satara which is a beautiful compound and it's mostly Mayavadi compound but I used to go there and I would, I would chant Japa there and there was a Shiva temple inside of the compound and in that temple there is a deity of Shiva he's dancing Shiva in the dancing pose. So I would go and take darshan from Lord Shiva. And I've also gave classes at that temple. They, the priest asked me to give classes. So on Shiva Ratri one day I spoke the glories of Lord Shiva. But a beautiful deity of Shiva. And there's at least a couple other places where you find deities of Shiva that are installed in certain temples. But I'm not sure where else. Um, oh, maybe in also in uh, Kashi. Kashi's the place of Lord Shiva. Benares, Varanasi. We call it now. The old name is was known as Varanasi. That was the old name. Then it became Benares. Now it's Kashi, right? So he's called Kashi, was he called Kashi? Kashi Raj. Kashi? Kashi Raj. I mean, Raj means king. king of Kashi. Kashi Raj, yeah. Yeah, she was called Kashi Raj. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Question? Um, yes, Guru Maharaj. I was thinking about the very last... Uh, First, thank you, Guru Maharaj, for this really interesting class. Um, in the end, we talked about how really we should be humble and that humility is uh, actually what a devotee should be, humble. So I have a question about real humility versus low self-esteem when we are feeling poorly, I'm useless, I'm stupid, I'm crazy, I'm this and that. Uh, I mean, how do we know that it's real humility or just low self-esteem? If you're thinking crazy, low, and like that, you're not, that's not humility. That's just a deranged mind. <laughs> that's all it is. Humility means to understand your position, that's all. Hmm. That you are small, that's all. And Krishna is great. Humility means not to want to be honored by others. That's that's a characteristic. If you want honor from others, or you, or you expect honor from others, then that's uh, that's contrary. So, one who is humble doesn't want to be honored by others. That's a quality of humility. And there's others. Humility will give respect and service to others and not wanting respect and service for oneself. That's also a quality of humility. Mm -hmm. Now, 
low self-esteem is just, it's a material thing. It has nothing to do with spiritual life. Low self-esteem means I tried to be the best and I failed, therefore I give up. <laughs> That's low self-esteem. It's just, it's just pride turned inside out. That's all it is. If I can't, if I can't be the best, then I just feel good being low. <laughs> it's, the soul is part and parcel of Krishna. Therefore, the soul is actually wonderful. But you have to know your position. The soul is, you know, tiny, jiva. So, if you say, I can't do anything, or I can't do this, that means you don't understand the, under, the, prop, the proper connection. Because with the mercy of Krishna, one can do great things. And without the mercy of Krishna, one can't do anything. <laughs> so therefore, one who's humbled looks for the mercy of the Lord. So Srila Prabhupada, I mean, he opened, you know, hundreds of temples and made, wrote so many books, traveled around the world, was glorified by great personalities. Still, he remained humble because he understood it's Krishna, it's not me. I'm simply trying to carry out his instructions and by his mercy, this is, this is, I'm becoming successful. Mm. Arjun. Mm. He was a powerful warrior and he defeated so many other powerful warriors. But when Krishna left the planet, he wanted to use Arjun as an example. And so Arjuna couldn't do anything. He had his bow. When he was talking to Yudhisthira, he, he had, because he was lamenting. And uh, Yudhisthira is asking him, why are you lamenting? And he goes through so many reasons. But he said, I have my bow, I have my powerful arms, I have my arrows. But they're all useless, because Krishna's gone. <laughs> So when he tried to protect the uh, queens who were traveling, uh, they got captured by some cowherd men. And Arjun was there to try to defend the queens, but he couldn't. The cowherd men defeated him. <laughs> so that pastime is to illustrate Arjun was his power, Krishna did that just to show that his power is my power. It's not his power. <laughs> I mean, if Krishna wants, he can just take everything away. and You can't even remember who you are, where you are, why you are, why you, how you are. You can't, you can't do nothing. You can't even do anything if Krishna wants. He can take everything away. He can make you so stupid you can't even talk. <laughs> I guess that's good for a few people. <laughs> it's benefit it's benefit the rest of the world. <laughs> you know, so Krishna's all powerful. Rake Krishna Moreke, Mori Krishna Rakeke. If he wants to kill you, you can't, it's nothing can save you, no matter how powerful you are. And if he wants to save you, nobody can harm you. That's Krishna. So when one remembers that everything is the mercy of the Lord coming through the disciplic succession, then one is in the proper consciousness. What can I do? <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Any other questions? Hare Krishna Maharaj, question about humility. Humility. Is it okay to be humiliated to become more humble? Can you repeat that again? Um, uh -huh, okay. Is it okay to be humiliated to become more humble? If it works, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Whatever makes you humble, it's good. <laughs> but usually when you're humiliated, you always react in the other way, and you try to fight back. <laughs> but if you accept it, then, yeah, that helps you. But it, always, it doesn't always work like that, but it can. <laughs> it's up to you. <laughs> Krishna's put me in this ba embarrassing situation and to just to purify me, <laughs> make me more humble. Thank you. Shema Bhagavatam ki jai, Shila Prabhupada ki jai.